I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Oh, indeed, you, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learnt to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of, of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica in Macedonia, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And may God and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Tukumbo Gunake, and I'm a member of the church family here, and it's it's always great to come together and hoping and see God's word. And um, I say hello to those online as well. You will think that this modern age, this modern world we are in, we are a lot more happier than it was, than people were maybe four or five hundred years ago, or even about two hundred years ago especially in the Western world, where we, we have more reasons to be happy. We have, in a way, poverty, literacy, edu freedom, a lot more education. Things are improving, have improved, and our consumption has gone up as well. We have technology at our disposal. We have information, massive information. Medical science is at burns. We're very aware of social issues. And our lifestyle choices are greater. So you expect us to be happier. But those who study these things are not absolutely convinced. As a matter of fact, you could argue that people that were well before us over 200 years ago, 200 years ago were happier. But there's one thing that is for sure. We want to be happy and we want to stay happy. That is the way we are wired as humans. You see, happiness is treated as a commodity and can be purchased at a price. At a click, you can have happiness. That feeling that everything is okay, everything is well. Political sociology and psychology writers have explored ways of 
making us happy and stay happy. So they write a lot. They give us that perspective of how to be happy. A lot of writings, a lot of stuff being written and put together. And they tell us that you can actually synthesize, synthesize happiness. You can manufacture it. But the happiness of the Bible is deep and is profound. It's joyous and does not depend or is not found in the circumstances we have. It is not superficial and it's fundamental to the Christian life. Paul tells us to rejoice, rejoice, to be joyful. And today, is the re- re- writing or the reading, as, God, as Paul speaks God's word, is saying to us, we can, find, we can find that deep joy, that happiness. We can find it. And he's showing and sharing with us what it means. As he's told us in the last few weeks, if you've been with us, looking at the book of Philippians. Because we've been studying this book that has been about joy. And so people call it joy, Paul's joy letter. It, it, it can't be anything else because joy is mentioned about 26 times only. Rejoice, rejoice always. And today we've just read the last bit. We're on the last leg, the last lap, the end bit. As Paul extends his final greetings and thanksgiving to the believers in Philippi. And he says this with prayers and encouragement. And I hope we have our Bibles open to page 1181 to, as we go through together. You can see Paul has an affection and love for the Philippians. You can see the depth of it. Rejoicing with them always. Rejoicing in the partnership they have at the beginning in chapter 1. And in this part of the letter... He thanks them for the continued partnership. They've been supporting him all along. And you can sense the spontaneity, the wholehearted writing in Paul's letter. Because what he has observed, what has been fed back to him. In verse 10, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have renewed your concern for me. He appreciated how they've stepped up how they've supported him multiple times. He's saying, you, it was good that you were givers. You gave. They stood out as well, of all the churches around. They stood out and they did well. They were prepared to share with him in giving and receiving. If you look at verse 15, Paul was overflowing with the generosity, uh, with joy at their generosity. And he wanted them to know clearly his happiness and joy did not come from the gifts he received. Now, that's very hard. If someone gives you something you need and you're happy and you receive it well and you you say to them, thank you very much, I'm happy, I'm joyful. But But to me, to me, he's saying, I'm not benefiting personally from this. You're giving it to God. And he's saying this because he was content. He was full of contentment. So even though Paul trusted and was confident in God's care and provision, he knew how to write a very gracious thank you note to the people who supported him. Relatively, the the church in Philippi was not very rich. But they'd send food, clothing, and money to Paul while he was in Rome through Epaphroditus. And this generosity impressed Paul so much. And he says this verse 17, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. You see, Paul was more interested in their spiritual benefit rather than in his own material gain. He wasn't in so much interested in being comfortable, being well-fed and satisfied. He was interested in accruing what you may call eternal dividends. 
to the lives of the people he loved, to the lives of the believers in Philippi. And Paul described the gift as in, in verse 18 as a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This is Paul using very Old Testament language, not saying, not only did you give to me, but you also gave it to God. You gave it to God. You see, his joy came not because he finally received what he had been wanting, but because they're giving you something that honored God and would accrue to their spiritual benefit. What is this benefit? That you're receiving Christ, you're dedicating this to God. That is the benefit. And Paul finished this thank you note by saying, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, in verse 19. And that is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. And he's saying, Paul was saying, you gave this to me in a way that left you in need. And I want to assure you that God will not remain in your death. A promise from God that God will supply all your needs. And this is referring to the material sacrifice that the Philippians had gone through. And the, the response is, with the sacrifice and your offering, you will be amply refreshed. And what does Paul show us here? Well, that we can receive with gratitude. And it's a sign of healthy and humble spirit. It's a sign of contentment towards God for what God has provided. That we can share and give in contentment. One thing we know for sure, that it is sometimes easier to make money than give it out. Let's check ourselves. It is sometimes easier. When we pursue money, the magnetism of it draws us so close that we sometimes stress about giving it away. And Paul is saying here, in verse 19, that God will supply all our needs. As he spoke to these Philippians, who did not have much, but gave so much. So Paul was content. How difficult it is, is it to be content, to be content in life, to have this contentment of the Bible that Paul is speaking to us about this morning. Would you describe yourself as a content person? Or do you think you could be content if only one or two things were changed in your life? If you had a bit more money, a little less stress, more of something else, a better job, an extra holiday a year, or a combination of those, would that make you more content? None of these are inherently wrong. But when they become things that we think we can be content about, things that can replace God in our lives, we can be disappointed. We can think of a, of a, of a donkey reaching out for a carrot, place before it. Hunger before it. One more step. One more thing I would do and everything would be okay. Only to discover once we have it, contentment is still beyond us. The deep contentment of the Bible is not the contentment of a click on the internet. And Paul says in verse 11, as we look at it, I can be he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He's appreciating the generosity of the Philippians, but declaring that deep-rooted foundation of his joy and happiness.
And he explains to us in verse 12. Let's look at it. This is because, this is how, what he reads. Verse 12 reads, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. So what did he know? What did he learn? As Richard read verse 9 to us, thankfully, Paul encouraged the Philippians in verse 9 that whatever they learned they received from him, whatever they seen in him, they should put it into practice. So Paul knew what it was to be in abundance, what, to be, what it is to be hungry, to have a stomach <laughs> craving for a muscle of food he went through. And he shared his knowledge. He shared his experience. Not to boast, but to encourage and bless the Philippines. So, Paul's contentment goes beyond material value of the gift he receives. It's not dependent on his circumstance, whether he had plenty or he was hungry, whether he was well-fed or struggled, whether he was in chains or he was free. And he says in verse 13, I can do everything to him who gives me strength. Paul had learned this tricky secret. And what is this everything? What is the everything that Paul is talking about? Newer versions of the Bible say all things. What is all things? Again, this is one of the most quoted Bible passages. And sometimes it is misinterpreted. And mostly, honestly, it is with good intention. You will find that slogan in, in sports or athletes shirt, in placards, even tattoos. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And you see it even plaques. I have one at home too. Nothing is impossible with God, we say. That's true. But it doesn't say I can run 100 meters faster than using boats. It doesn't say I can lift a 100 kilogram dumbbell with one hand. So if you look at that verse on its own, it can be misinterpreted. But we see what Paul is saying if we step back, look back through two verses. He is saying, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He can do hungry. He can do fed, being fed. He can do plenty. He can do abundance. These are the things he means. It means both positive and negative things. It means the difficult and easy things in life. It can be in this range of situations and be joyous because he knows the secret of contentment. This is Paul writing from a prison with a death threat hanging over him. An American 20th century writer, Dale Carnegie, well renowned for his writing, not known as a Christian, but a lot of his writings were actually based, were based on the Bible. And he, he said this, two men were looking out from cells from a prison in the same direction. One man saw mud and filth, as in F-M-U-D. The other saw stars. Paul is in prison. He sees the glory and he sees the joy of God, not only in himself, but in the believers in Philippi. He sees how the gospel is working in the lives of people around him, and he sees joy despite his circumstances. Death part is troubles. But let's admit in our own lives, when things are wonderful, we are prone to be happy. When our circumstances are good, we are happy. 
We are contented, we say. But when things are tough, we are, the joy seems to creep away. And we crave happiness as humans. So what is this secret? What is this depth? Thank you, Richard, for putting this up. So we do not need to crack a code to reveal the secret of Paul's contentment. Because it's a secret. is the depth of where Paul is at. On page 1180 of our Bible, it's actually showing up on the screen here, we see what Paul is saying. Whatever was to my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing grace of knowing Jesus Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I'll stop there for a minute. Here is the pointer, one of the pointers to, uh, the pointers to one of Paul's contentment. And the other second verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, Paul's allegiance and trust to Christ is above anything else, even to the point of death, the ultimate sacrifice. Paul has found something much, much profound, something bigger than him in life, something to gain in Jesus Christ. And I finished that reading. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So his righteousness is not his own, but that which comes from faith in God through Jesus Christ. So Paul has found acceptance in God through Jesus Christ. He's found that depth of joy. Not the contentment of a clique, I say. And what strength? The strength that comes from the Lord Jesus. So, what is your priority? What is my priority? Is it Happiness or is it righteousness? What will you and I do differently from this? You see, Paul's contentment is a byproduct of something much, much bigger. Seek righteousness, you get happiness. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You see, we are well driven to seek happiness in life. God is great, as we said, but sometimes I just want to be happy. You see, we seek that superficial happiness that creates anxiety. People say, I want, yes, I want to be happy. I want to be happy forever. I want this moment to stay forever. Whatever moment you're enjoying. I'm sorry, the McDonald's Happy Meal does not last very long. The exotic holidays will come to an end. But not that the Bible teaches against holidays or having a fast meal. But when we start craving those things to satisfy the longings of our heart, which only the presence of God can feel, we get disappointed. We will be disappointed. Like filling an empty space with the cravings of our happiness. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added, given to you as well. Will God make you happy? Yes, no, yes, no. But if we seek God with conditions attached, well, when the seasons in life change, when things are not right, and life circumstances change, when things are not abundant, 
we can become disappointed. It's universal that life changes for all of us as humans. We go through those seasons. God loves us for sure. He is a father in heaven. He is a creator. And as Paul shows us, he will meet all our needs. But he does not hold us. God's promise is that he will meet all our needs according to his glorious riches, not according to our wants. What Paul learned, we must learn. He learned from the school of discipleship with Christ to give and receive with contentment, to give and receive with joy. He learned from the school of discipleship and as experience will tell, this is sometimes not learned in terms of abundance. We're learned in terms of adversity and hardship. When we speak to friends who have been through hardship, we find them knowing the deep joy of the Lord Jesus a lot more. Are you content? The question is not about whether there are circumstances about our lives that we would like to change. <laughs> there are always circumstances we want to change. The question is rather, can we be content in them? Is that possible? You see, Contentment is not a destination we arrive at when we finally decide that we have enough material possessions, we have achieved all that we want to achieve, all our external circumstances are resolved. It is not a transient state that hinges on external factors or everything aligning perfectly in our lives. Rather, it is a deep-rooted choice a conscious decision that transcends all our circumstances. As we come to an end of this joyous letter, joyous book of Philippians, I hope if you've been here for the term, there's something you can take away, or there are things you've taken away from all the different passages we have looked at. But one thing that is for sure is Paul writes and speaks God's word to us today that we should live in faith, live in faith and walk with Christ. Joyously, I must add. May we share Paul's aspiration and seek to know Jesus Christ more and more. May we rejoice with Paul as he did with the Philippians and we dedicate our lives to finding joy and contentment in the Lord Jesus. May we put into practice what we have learned from Paul in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>